Welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS and welcome to our weekly review of international affairs where we curate a series of events, issues and individuals to help you prepare better for your general studies, for your IR paper and to cope with developments in international politics, how they impinge on our national interest, how our foreign policy is adjusted according to that, how power equations change. And this time we have a very interesting episode for you. Uh, for a long time, the world has been talking about the ticking time bomb, the climate change, and suddenly it exploded. And the whole world seems to be engulfed with extreme weather events, forest fires, flash fires, heat waves, floods, droughts, and all, all of that. And it has become impossible to say that this is a crisis which can be postponed any further. Uh, we will discuss this at length because there has been a tendency among the great powers, the big powers, to push this on the back burner. They think that the issues of strategy, geoeconomics are more important. Now, suddenly it is becoming obvious that the climate impinges on everything, on strategy, uh, on geopolitics, on economics. So we'll discuss this. Then there are some very interesting developments which are taking place diplomatically. Uh, President Putin of Russia decided to visit go outside his country for the first time after his invasion, what he calls a special operation in Ukraine, to Tehran and to have a top-level meeting with Ayatollah Khamenei there. It was a triangular uh, diplomatic uh, meeting where Erdogan of uh, Turkey had also come. So this was a major realignment of uh, countries which are uh, cocking a snoop at uh, uh, the Western powers. And this seems to be a readjustment of the Western advance in this area. The Americans have tried to dictate how China should be countervailed, how economic sanctions against Russia should be imposed, against Iran should be imposed. So two of the major targets were brought together. And Turkey is a very interesting actor who has who is a member of NATO, but he has uh, put a veto on the membership of Norway and Sweden. It has had a fraught relationship with Americans. It has been denied the membership of the European Union, but it tries to play the role of an important broker in this region. And part of the meeting with uh, Putin is interesting uh, in the context of how the grain is to be moved out of Ukraine or Russia. That's one. Then there was another hectic round of diplomatic activity by the American President Biden, who visited Middle East, who visited Israel, who visited Saudi Arabia. And the Americans had been criticizing ever since American Saudi journalist Khashoggi's murder that it was directly the um, sources were linking it to the crown prince. But the crown prince is now effectively the ruler. And uh, Biden had to swallow his pride, visit and very indirectly say that we brought it to his notice that this kind of thing would, was not acceptable to America, but we shall get into that. So at one level, the Americans are trying to cultivate Israelis and Saudis uh, to counter Iran in this area. Uh, on the other hand, the Russians and Iranians are getting together. Turkey is playing a very interesting role. And then there was a third round of negotiations, which is called I2U2. Uh, Two I's, I2 are India and Israel, and U2 are USA and UAE. So some have referred to this as the Western Quads, but this is again an interesting thing because it reinforces India's relationship with Israel, which has grown steadily in the past. But India's relationship with USA has not been as warm, as reassuring, at least for the Americans, since the Russians invaded Ukraine, and the Americans have been disappointed about India's diplomatic response. So we'll talk of all this and a little more, time permitting. Let us begin with the climate crisis. The irony here has been that so far, the developed world has always thought that this crisis doesn't directly concern them. It concerns the survival of micro states in the South Pacific, it concerns the fate and the future of developing countries on the coastal areas of Africa, of South Asia, or maybe those indigenous populations who live in the rainforests in Amazon. But this time, what has happened is, it is not a forecast of doom when uh, surface of the sea waters will rise or the glaciers will melt, and there would be a problem for everybody because of internal dislocation, political instability, etc. This time, when the crisis exploded, it created a major problem of survival for the developed, developed countries themselves, mostly in Europe. 
Let's begin with Europe. Europe is experiencing extreme uh, hot weather conditions, the heat wave. Uh, it's been estimated that 1,000 people have lost their lives in Europe due to this heat wave. Uh, United Kingdom has registered more than 40 degrees Celsius, the highest temperature recorded in the British Isles. Now, the interesting part is this, that most of Europe and United Kingdom is not geared to, not used to these high temperatures. There are people in Europe, even in the southern Europe, where they are used to cold climate, not such intolerant heat climate. So when the heat wave comes, they are totally unprepared for it. Uh, like, for instance, in, in Britain, they have had to cancel the metro services. They have to reduce metro services. They have slowed down the metro services. All their equipment and technology is not geared to cope with such temperatures. So whether it is computers, whether it is people running air conditioners in office, they were preparing for a very inclement winter uh, and to cope with the shortened supply of Russian gas. But suddenly they have been hit with the other contrast, the heat wave. Uh, it also is that so far people have been discussing the forest fires raising in Amazon rainforest. And it is easy to blame a dictator like Bolsonaro by saying that he is corrupt, he is helping his crony capitalist, he is clearing out thousands of hectares of uh, rainforest in a month, in a day. Uh, and then what is happening is land use is changing, the carbon sinks are shrinking, uh, it is going to change the climate in the long run. But what is happening today is that these forest fires have become almost uncontrolled. And um, human heritage sites like Heights of Machu Picchu have been threatened as far away as in Peru. Uh, there also have always been raging forest fires, not in rainforests only, but in uh, Australia. But they were against considered to be much too distant. Population in Australia is uh, not so dense. The vast spaces are there. So that it always was possible to distance oneself from this crisis. Europe can't avoid this. Now, what is happening in Europe is that the whole of Europe is suffering from flash fires. This is very close to the proximity of the cities. People have had to be evacuated from their residences. Businesses are suffering. And the, the hope of reviving the economy because of tourist influx is seriously jeopardized by these forest fires. These flash fires are very close proximity to beaches, to city centers, and so on. And what is happening is their efforts to fight them through technological means have not been very successful. They send planes up, they send helicopters up, but even the helicopter pilots and plane, planes have met with accidents and the forest fires continue to rage. So the, the Europeans just don't know what is happening. The for, these flash fires are engulfed France, they have engulfed Portugal, they have engulfed Spain, they have engulfed Italy, they have, they have touched Greece. So there is no, and Belgium and uh, Germany are threatened. So you can just see that no part of, and Europe is so uh, interconnected, so interdependent that if a calamity of this kind happens, you don't know what is going to happen uh, to, the, to the other country. And not all countries are even prepared to cope with this kind of a thing. It is totally unprecedented disaster. And you can say it is a natural disaster, but one would be tempted to argue that it is a man-made disaster as long as the well-fed affluent European nations and the Americans thought that this was a problem of the poor far away from their homelands, they suddenly have got a wake-up call that is, it can cost their economies a lot, it can cost them great damage in life and in uh, property, and their recovery uh, post-COVID uh, post might become very, very difficult. Now, in this context, there is one more thing which we must keep in mind. It is not that the North American continent is safe. These forest fires have been threatening lives in the San Francisco Bay Area as well, in the state of California also. Their national past by Yushamite, etc. have been threatened. Habitat is threatened. Canada is also experiencing odd temperatures in British Columbia and so on. But then, get back to the United States. The United States Supreme Court has come out with a judgment which has emasculated the Environmental Protection Agency in America and almost rendered it impossible for Biden to redeem his promise that he would reduce carbon emissions, he would take steps and take measures and adopt policies which can cope with the crisis of the, of the climate. So the, the United States Supreme Court has been controversial for a variety of reasons, Roe and Wade, uh, the abolition of abortion as a right uh, to women, also the right to bear arms, all these things have been retrograde. They are uh, reactionary. But the most disaster can in, in near future can prove to be the Environmental Protection Agency being curbed 
from adopting measures to co take measures immediately to cope with this crisis. There is, uh, in the month, uh, in a couple of months to come, there is a COP27 scheduled. But if the Americans have been crippled, can they play any significant role in, in this COP27? And can any decisions be taken there or differentiated by equated responsibilities and so on? We hear these phrases. Again, China is reading under flux. Floods, India is reading under floods, Pakistan is reading under floods, Bangladesh is reading under floods, and also interestingly, at the same time, on the African continent, some countries are suffering floods and some countries are in the drought situation. So, unpredictability of the weather, increased frequency of extreme weather events, like 17,000 lightning strikes uh, in a year in, in the region of Alaska, much more than historically recorded in the past. What is happening? Nobody knows. And there have been forecasts of devastating tornadoes and cyclones. So the world better wake, wake up and take notice. The Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, in an articulated speech, in a stunning speech, has said that either we take common action or we accept that we are committing suicide together. But as we all know, uh, however eloquent the words of the Secretary General, the United Nations is totally uh, incapacitated, incapable of either taking a decision or enforcing them whether it is human rights, whether it is stopping uh, aggression or, or the climate. But the climate change, the major powers, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, and the most populous nations like India and Indonesia, Brazil, have to be on the same page. But it is difficult that when we discussed, uh, when we are prefacing this episode, that if the diplomatic blocks are clearly divided between a pro-American bloc and pro-Western bloc, and a pro-Russian Chinese bloc, India in a very difficult position, you cannot imagine that the climate change challenge can be met with uh, effectively. The Indian Prime Minister has been very, very far-sighted in this context, and he has talked of a solar alliance, he has talked of a wind energy alliance, he has taken initiative in that. But unfortunately, India is neither United States of America, nor Russia, nor China as yet. People are, are, are speculating that India might be the most populous nation in the world uh, in a year's time, but it doesn't mean that it will be as militarily powerful or a veto holding member in the Security Council like China. It certainly doesn't have the land expense or the gas resources like Russia or the gold reserves. So, and Americans are a different category altogether. So, climate, the Middle Eastern Arab kingdoms and the Gulf states have started preparing for this day uh, ever since Abraham Accord. But Indians are preparing for this, but they are not in a position to decisively influence either diplomacy. They can build on a consensus. But India's greatest uh, influence is on countries which don't belong to a particular bloc. So it comes back again to the early days of the non line movement. Will India's call be heeded by other countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America? And would there be a multilateral forum which would be in a position to exert pushback and do something, not to commit suicide, but to take collective action to save the planet. The world was quite surprised when President Putin of Russia declared that he was going to visit Iran for a summit meeting with the supreme uh, leader of the nation, Ayatollah Khamenei. This is the first time since his intervention, his special operation in Ukraine, that the Russian leader is stepping out of his country uh, to visit another country. So this is decidedly a very important matter for the Russian president. Why is it an important matter is easy to see. Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei has prepared the ground for this meeting by coming out openly in support of Russia in a manner which even the Chinese have not done. He said openly, explicitly, that Putin did the right thing by intervening militarily in Ukraine. Had he not done that, the Ukrainians would have be, been able to thrust the war on him and he would have to fight on their terms, maybe on his own soil. Now, whether we agree with this interpretation or we don't, we must realize that Iran has come out more openly, more clearly in support of Putin than anybody else. That's one part. The second part is that the, both these countries, Putin's Russia and Khamenei's Iran, are the two worst targeted states for economic sanctions by the West. Uh, as far as the President Biden was talking about the resurrection of the nuclear deal which uh, Trump had trashed, which Obama had worked very hard on, it was in limbo. But now it seems it's all but dead because the seventh round of economic sanctions has been 
talked about on Russia and Iran. Fresh tensions have been imposed. So these two have an essential community of interest, an overlap of interest. The Russian and Iranians have a very vital interest in showing the world that American sanctions are useless. They can st- Any nation which is targeted can stand up to it and they are working on an alternative mechanism which may ultimately do more damage to the SWIFT and the financial system which the Americans since Britain would had put in place. So that is in a matter, realm of speculation. But then Chinese who have played very carefully not come out openly uh, condemning Russia but not supporting as explicitly as the Iranians but both have been beneficiaries of cooperating, collaborating with Russia in uh, weakening the sanctions against it. Iran has been dealing, transferring its oil via Russia, via China to distant uh, buyers. And all this is a complex situation where the economic interest, the strategic interest of China, Russia and Iran seem to coalesce. But let's get back to the triangular uh, summit meeting in Tehran. Now, the third party in this was Erdogan of Turkey. Now, this is again very interesting because Turkey is a member of NATO. And it has had a fraught relationship with the United States. They scrapped the F-35 gentrified deal because they were buying S-400 anti-missile systems batteries from Russia. But the Americans did it carefully, did not go beyond issuing warnings that if this continued, their future collaboration would not be there. And this has encouraged Turkey to flex its muscles even more. Now, it is interesting because Turkey has been facing very severe economic crisis. Its um, currency is falling very badly. Uh, there is some unrest, but Erdogan of Turkey has managed to emerge as a dealer in military hardware, maybe not the top of the line stuff, but various purchase buyers who want to prefer to get drones, to get fighters, to get naval vessels from uh, Turkey to Pakistan. There has been some collaboration with India as well. Now, Turkey is a very interesting country, if you see. It is located geopolitically in a situation where it commands uh, the entry and access to the Black Sea. It is the Dardanelles and Bosphorus, and it is it is a trijunction of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Now, not only Turkey is a member of NATO, it also has threatened to exercise its veto not to let Norway and Sweden become members of the NATO. Now, Turkey's interest is that the Norway and Sweden, trying to support the human rights, have been harboring and sheltering Kurd terrorists. Now. The Turkish definition of Kurd freedom fighters as terrorists may not be acceptable to everybody, but as far as Turkey is concerned, it says that uh, it used a rather crude phrase that we have removed the testicles of Norway and Sweden and they would have to give us what we want, which means that they would have to repatriate the uh, Kurds which they have been sheltering. And Turkey has another interest that the Russians and Iranians are very active in Syria and Syrian President Assad has tried to restore his relationship with his Arab neighbors in the Middle East, in Saudi Arab and in UAE. But that is again a long drawn process. But the Turks are also interested that it, it, nobody should interfere if they attack in Syria and drive the Kurds out of the territories which they control. Now this Kurdish problem is a very vexed one. The Kurds are disputed partly in Turkey, partly in Iran, bits of Iraq, some parts of Syria. So there is, and they they have they fought very well to defeat the ISIL. They control territories uh, in Iraq and elsewhere where oil is located. But now there is no unity among these fighting forces. It doesn't appear that either Putin or the Iranians will grant the wish of uh, Erdogan to have a free hand in Syria. But Turkey has another interesting problem. Turkey may keep threatening Norway and Sweden Sweden about their membership in NATO, but there is a limit to blackmail, a limit to wolf, wolf, wolf. Earlier, it had come halfway towards an agreement. So I think the European Union at one time will have to say that, look, neither can Russia have a veto on Ukraine's membership, fast candidature in European Union, nor can the NATO membership of Norway and Sweden be held to ransom by Turkey in all, for all time to come. So all this would depend on how effectively Turkey manages its economy, at least in the short term. Turkey realizes, Erdogan particularly, 
that this opportunity may not come to him in his lifetime once again. This is where he has announced grand plans of canals cutting through Istanbul and connecting all-time access to Black Sea and to Mediterranean. But the interesting part is this, after the war, sooner or later, reaches some kind of a closure in Ukraine, nobody would need Turkey as desperately. Neither would the Russia require it, nor the Ukrainians require it. For at the moment, it is said that the passage of grains from Ukraine and Russia can only be done with the good offices of Turkey and it saves Europe and Africa from acute food shortages. So this is the issue there. And now interestingly, we will have to worry about the changing configuration of this, these geopolitical contours in Central Asia and West Asia. This is what the real significance of the tripartite summit meeting in Tehran is. Uh, there has been speculation that uh, Erdogan is so arrogant that he kept Putin waiting for a few seconds before he appeared in the room. But all this is psychological, uh, if not warfare, posturing to say that I'm indispensable. People will have to come to me. Now, people have also said that Iran has been supplying some drones to Russia, which again is part of the psychological operation. Uh, and Iran probably is trying to show that whatever Israel may threaten, nobody can stop them from acquiring nuclear weapons, whether they declare it or they don't declare it. And let's not forget that Israel would be uh, taking a great risk if it launches a preemptive strike against Iran, because Iran has depth, Iran has technological uh, skills and expertise, and it also has a revolutionary Islamic fervor, which has helped it survive the Iran-Iraq war, which has helped it survive other military hostilities. It has helped Iran survive the economic sanctions for decades. And Iran has not been brought down to its knees. Iran is a major oil producing country and has found a way, as we discussed a little earlier, of rooting out its oil despite the American sanctions. So this is something which India has to watch carefully. India has increased its oil imports from Russia. India has said that it cannot overnight stop buying arms from Russia. And the Americans have kept quiet about this, although they have made unhappy noises that this cannot continue. But they have kept talking about that, you know, countering American adversaries through sanctions at Katsa. They keep talking about it, but they keep talking about exemptions also. So this situation is very fluid in Central Asia and in West Asia. Just before Putin embarked on his dramatic tour of Tehran and met with Erdogan and Khamenei, the President of the United States had also tried to recalibrate the USA's relationship uh, with Saudi Arabs and reassure Israel that Trump's departure or the political instability in Israel had not made a difference to them. Uh, the interesting thing about Biden and Saudi Arabia is that ever since the murder of the US Saudi journalist Khashoggi, the Americans had come down very hard on the crown prince of Saudi Arabia because they thought that all the inquiries led their uh, trail straight to the crown prince. It was at his command that Khashoggi had been murdered, brutally murdered, in the Saudi embassy in Turkey. Now, again, you see the tangled relationships. The Saudis have a legation in Turkey. Uh, Turkey turns the blind eye towards whatever is happening on its territory. Uh, the inquiries are not made. Uh, the crown prince is absolved of any crimes. And ultimately, they argue that it was a rogue elements of the secret service of Saudi Arabia who were summarily executed. So there is no, no trace, no evidence. And he can wash his hands clean and say, uh, they thought, the rogue elements thought that he would like Khashoggi um, murdered and they did it. Now, this is the kind of thing which is uh, not acceptable to Americans, although they do things of this kind and much worse on their own. But they keep talking about the violation of human rights and clandestine covert operations on other parts which are unacceptable. Now, so Biden had said that I would not talk to, not shake hands with the crown prince. But in between, things have changed much. What has happened is that the, after the signing of the Abram Accords, Israel has re repaired its relationship with the Gulf countries, UAE, Oman, and has built its bridges with Saudi Arabia. 
it is holding out the promise of technology which will help these countries retain their prosperity in the post fossil fuel economy and also to cope with climate change and so on and have maybe promised them with a nuclear power plant for peaceful energy now all this makes israel very uh, welcome including uh, israeli tourists have started coming to the gulf countries and so on now the interesting part is this that in between uh, the crown prince has yet to become the king but he is actually the virtual ruler much more than he ever was before so biden has to biden has to live with him so biden came and everybody was waiting for those photo opportunities will biden shake hands or not so biden did the covid bump he just bumped his fist with the crown prince's fist but the the message was not lost he he had eaten the humble pie he 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 said that i brought to the crown prince's notice uh, the khashoggi murder and how it was unacceptable uh, there was immediately a denial by the foreign minister of saudi arabia that no such conversation had taken place so this made uh, the white house spokesperson to come out that no no this had happened but it was it was indirectly referred to him so what matters is that nobody would ever know that what biden said or did not say but the fact remains that biden and the united states have to live with saudi arabia and crown prince mbs and keep it on their side there is too much at stake the american oil companies have investments there the saudi arab right after united states have a massive oil um, storage with it and how do you detach them disentangled with them uh, an ally which has been which has been through you with the cold war and is a very important economic ally let's not forget that even after the twin world trade towers were raised by the al qaeda attack uh, osama bin laden's family did go straight out of united states and without any hindrance let or hindrance so the americans have double standards when it comes to human rights in saudi arabia saudi arabia also is the custodian of the most holy places of the muslims and americans are already blamed for islamophobia waging a war against islam uh, so they tread rather uh, carefully when 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 we least is concerned also let's not forget that they are using israel as a proxy when israel is coming closer and closer and finding in making inroads into this area it is with american blessings only so it, uh, israel itself could not do all this by all alone now biden was very keen to go to israel and assure them that he biden incidentally did go to the palestinian authority where slogans were raised against him uh, but it was just a whistle stop journey both in israel and in the palestinian territories so it didn't mean a thing it was tokenism at its uh, best and a failure at its worst you can pick and choose whatever you do so biden's visit has not made any point that the americans are in a position to either restrain their protege israel from behaving in an irresponsible manner almost like a rogue state to threaten iran or to make life miserable for the palestinians and this is not going to end uh, the intifada the Uh, the rebellion the terroristic activities of the palestinian youth which have grown up like this uh, facing this so israel doesn't change the only hope is that if they but that hope is hoping against hope uh, uh, if the israelis get a clear uh, any party gets a clear cut majority then there might be some policy clarity but if, if it doesn't happen if benjamin netanyahu bounces back the instability will continue so the palestinians cannot hope for much the lebanese cannot hope for much and again when we come to lebanese and the palestinians please do not forget that iran is a major presence lurking in the background the hezbollah the army of the god allah is supported by iranians uh, the iran militias in the palestinian area or in southern sudan uh, yemen are again supported by iranians so iran is very much an important party but americans to our mind are going all the wrong way round by imposing Uh, sanctions which have not succeeded probably there was some hope had they got a dialogue going with uh, um, iran and made it worth their while to make some concessions and perhaps then a reconciliation of sorts however limited could have taken place but it has not not happened and biden goes back uh, and biden gets busy with problems of the american continent his supreme court his precarious majority in the senate elections in various state uh, congresses house of representatives and all the time 2024 the presidential re-election bid and the candidature continues to lurk so we don't think 
that Biden's visit is, is of the same significance as Putin's visit to Tehran. The most interesting diplomatic development from the India's point of view was the virtual meet, summit meet of I2U2. Before we proceed any further, let's see what I2U2 is. The two I's are India and Israel, and the two U's are USA and UAE. So some people have said that this is also the Western Quad. The Indians were a part of the quads, but then the quads was relegated into the margins when AUKUS was organized. India was given totally different responsibilities in the South China Sea, in the Indian Ocean region. And Indian enthusiasm for acting at the American behest as a countervailing element against China was lost to a certain extent. So this could be a bit of a compensation prize uh, for India and say consolation prize and say that, look, you have a role in both sides or uh, to the west of the Arabian Sea and on the Bay of Bengal region also. But let's see what this means. Uh, the interesting part is this, that Israel is a key here. We said that Israel is a key in most of the developments in this region. And in recent years, India's relationship with Israel has become more closer. And when, when an old Indian diplomat expressed the opinion that India was flirting with Israel, which was not in conformity with its traditional policies, the Israeli um, foreign ministry spokesperson immediately found factual errors with the Indian senior Indian retired diplomats' statements and said that Israel and India have come closer and uh, they are having a coincidence of interest from military hardware to cutting edge technologies of agriculture to medicine to vaccines and is, is going to be a lasting relationship. Now, the ruling party in India, the BJP-led NDA coalition, has always advocated closer relationship with uh, Israel from day one. So it was the Congress government in past, Congress governments in past, which had tilted towards the Palestinians because the government then dependent on the support of the CPI members, was very, very pro-Soviet. So things have changed. And this relationship has become an important relationship in terms of ex exchange of intelligence, etc. So Israel is one and India is one. Now, what is there is that India has also focused on multilateral forums, which allow India to play a more significant role than in certain other forums where India cannot play that role. So let's take Say, for instance, BRICS. BRICS was at one time projected as a very important multilateral forum, but where if you have Russia and if you have China, to veto holding members, uh, compared to that, in I2U2, you only have one member, USA, the veto holding member, and US and Israel seem to be bringing, luring India in to a closer relationship with the Western alignment of forces, which is taking place today. We did mention a little earlier in this dialogue with you today that the Putin, Tehran, Turkey realignment, the rearrangement seems to be pushing back against the Western dominance. And if you throw China into it, from the South China Sea to almost West Asia and Central Asia, you see this pushback going. So Israel and India have a coincidence of interest. They have drawn closer to each other together. There are no irritants. Now, even the large majority of Indian Muslim population doesn't argue that India should tilt towards Palestinians or tilt towards the Islamic nations because there has not been a quid pro quo and they are drawn into a conflict uh, of a religious sectarian conflict without anything. So the, unfortunately, the Palestinians do not have a support base even among the so-called minority the Muslims in India, not all of them support it. The, some leftists, some residual progressives still do. So Israel and India are very much on the same side. And then you see the, the Prime Minister Modi has taken trouble to cultivate the Gulf countries, especially the UAE, uh, to protect the interests of the Indian diaspora there, to have investments there, to invite investments from those, those countries, including from Saudi Arabia. So if we keep even Saudi Arabia out of the I2U2, we realize that India has extremely interesting overlap with Israel and UAE. And United States certainly has an overlap with Israel and UAE. So it is, and also India is not anti-US. 
the US may feel at the moment after the Russian intervention in Ukraine that Indians have not quite lived up to their expectations in support of democracy. But the fact remains, they realize that India has its own constraints. India is dependent on Russian import of uh, military hardware. India has a time-tested relationship with the, the Russians. India, despite the COVID and despite its military conflict in Galwan, has had its trade increasing and the trade imbalance increasing with China. So it is difficult for India to disentangle itself, even in the short term, from China and Russia and come entirely on the side of the Americans. And India is a large country. It is going to be the most populous country in a year's time. India is a predominant actor in the Southern Asian region. India has a great potential economically, although it has suffered due to COVID, it has suffered due to a variety of other supply chain interruptions. But India is the sixth largest economy in the world. The gap between it and the Chinese and the Japanese might be large. But then between India, if it pips Britain to the post, is much greater than the other countries put together lower down in the list. So the Americans would not do anything to upset or irritate India or to threaten it with sanctions if it deals with, continues to deal with Russia. But the challenge for Indian diplomacy would remain acute, acute in I2U2. Now, what the Prime Minister of India has tried to do is to uh, cushion the shocks, cushion the criticism. He has persuaded the UAE to invest uh, $3 billion in this I2U2 projects. And these would be food parks um, established in India. And these food parks in India would allow India to contribute towards helping others cope with their food security. It would help boost India's economy. It, these would be state-of-art technology would be provided by the Israelis and the Americans. So this would be a tripartite um, partnership on one side on technology and on the other side India, which would provide the land, which would provide the food grains which would also contribute towards technology and it would be more or less a grouping of nations as far as possible not swung not imbalanced not swayed by crude geostrategic consideration and let's not forget that the prime minister of india is the one who for the solar alliance who has been talking of wind power which has been talking of value additions making india for the world so this would also reduce India's dependence in terms of trade uh, with China. So this, is, this appears to be a win-win situation, I2U2. It has been criticized by some uh, who, who see an uh, American conspiracy to trap India into doing their bidding. But I think uh, India at the moment is not in a position to say that I'm an independent pole, pole of power, I'm an independent actor. It has to strike a very careful balance between time-tested friends like Russians, allies, not military allies, but people committed to development and democratic values like America. And with Israel, there is a very, very straight overlapping interest of strategy, technology, and also cultural affinity. The Israelis hark back to a pre-biblical past and have built a nation on that. And at the moment, India also has memories of a glorious past, which dates back to the historic era. So this is one forum which seems to appear, which will grow in importance in coming years in India. This is all we have for you this time. Until we meet again next time, the same advice. Please think over what we have discussed this time carefully. Split it into small elements, small units. This is important in the context of climate change. Climate change has several issues which might come as separate, discrete questions. It might be a question about destruction of rainforests. It might be a question about heat wave in Europe. It may, may be a question pertaining to uh, the flash fires. It may be a question pertaining to extreme weather events like flash floods or droughts or mudslides. But the thing which integrates all this is that this is an issue which cannot be postponed. It is no longer an issue which concerns only the developing world. It is not only a question of distant lands elsewhere. When it strikes the heart of Europe, it is no less important than, issue, than an issue of war and peace in Ukraine. So please think about it carefully and refresh your memory about the commitments made in different uh, conferences of parties and uh, summit meetings about uh, the weather change politics and so on. Then when we come to the diplomatic activity between Putin and Tehran, uh, please think in terms of a bloc pushing back. 
a new bloc emerging which includes Iran, it includes uh, Russia, uh, Moscow, it includes Beijing and China. And also it has unpredictable actors like Turkey, which have their feet in both camps. Member of NATO, but strained relationship with America. Uh, one time winning candidate for EU, but unhappy with EU at the moment but occupying a geopolitical situation and trying to take greatest leverage, greatest advantage of it, as long as the sun is shining in a manner of metaphorically speaking, for them, they are willing to make hay as long as the war in Ukraine is going on. Then you come to Biden's visit to Middle East, which was a damper, which was not quite successful, but it does indicate that the Americans have had to follow their pride and make peace reconciliation with MBS. Finally, we come to the new emerging constellation, the I2U2, where India and Israel, United States and UAE are on the same side and trying to forge a Western quad, so to speak, which seems to offer a win-win opportunity for all countries. Think about all this. Think about them separately. Think about the interconnection between these things. And that's the best way to prepare for international relations. Keep your facts straight. Don't be swayed by your own personal prejudices and try to have a rational argument for whatever you are saying and see the connections. Till we meet again next time, thank you and goodbye.